citizens were denied the possibility of a discovery process which is normally afforded to litigants. Without such discovery process, ICTS International would never be compelled by a court of law to give testimony and show evidence related to the missing airport video surveillance tapes of 9-11 or any other aspect of security measures in place on 9-11. A few quotes to digest. Evidence linking these Israelis to 9 is classified. I cannot tell you about evidence that has been gathered. It's classified information. But investigators within the DEA, INS, and FBI have all told Fox News that to pursue or even suggest Israeli spying through Converse is considered career suicide. While an Israeli real estate magnate from Australia insured his 99-year lease on the retail space of the World Trade Center against terrorism, one of Israel's biggest companies pulled out of the North Tower just days before September 11th. Zim American Israeli Shipping Company, Incorporated, broke the lease when it vacated the rented offices on the 16th and 17th floors of the North Tower of the World Trade Center shortly before the September 11th disaster. According to intelligence, Zim's World Trade Center office space had been leased until the end of the year and the company lost $50,000 when it suddenly pulled out in the beginning of September. The parent company, Zim Israel Navigation Company, is nearly half owned by the state of Israel. The other half held by Israel Corp. Zim is one of the world's largest container shipping companies operating an international network of shipping lines. The Israeli company's move out of the World Trade Center one week before the attacks saw the forfeiture of $50,000 in broken lease fees. Zim has since moved part of its operations to Houston, Texas. FBI agent Mike Dick aggressively investigated this Israeli ring before and after 9-11. Like another investigator by the name of O'Neill, Mike soon found himself removed from his duties on the orders of the then head of the Justice Department's criminal division, Michael Chertoff, a dual citizen of Israel. Dick was very suspicious when Israeli movers quickly moved Zim American Israel shipping company out of its 10,000 square feet of office space on the 17th floor of the North Tower of the World Trade Center and subsequent forfeiture of a $50,000 security deposit when they vacated one week prior to 9-11. According to a CIA non-official cover or NOC source or NOC source who worked with Dick, Israeli movers moved explosives into the 17th floor office space after Zim moved down. After 9-11, Dick, as well as the CIA not were harassed by their superiors on orders from above. Those orders came from the Jew Michael Chertoff. Dick was first relieved of his primary counter-espionage duties, eventually sent to Pakistan to investigate the kidnapping of Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Pearl, and eventually buried in a desk job at FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. According to the CIA source, Pearl was murdered because he was getting too close to the money trail that financed 9-11. The CIA source said, quote, the same group that beheaded Pearl in Pakistan Pakistan did the beheadings in Iraq, unquote. The source added that the beheadings were not Al-Qaeda. The CIA source, who emphasized his past Republican credentials, emphasized that Al-Qaeda was merely a list of arms dealers, mercenaries, drug dealers, financiers, and terrorists used by the CIA and Saudis during the Afghan Mujahideen War against the Soviets. The source also iterated that all the 9-11 hijackers had fake IDs during a joint CIA-FBI operation against lead hijacker Mohammed Atta in Fort Lee, New Jersey in 2000, the CIA and FBI team leaders complained to their superiors that their operation was being photographed by Israeli agents, thus compromising the operation. The CIA source affirmed that the Israelis in New Jersey were providing cover for the future hijacker teams. O'Neill had discovered that some of his Al-Qaeda targets, quote-unquote, were involved in some very un-Islamic fundamentalist activities, including drug smuggling, teenage prostitution, and blood diamond dealing. Los Angeles, 1997. A major local, state, and federal drug investigation sours. The suspects? Israeli organized crime, with operations in New York, Miami, Las Vegas, Canada, Israel, and Egypt. The allegations? 
cocaine and ecstasy trafficking, and sophisticated white-collar credit card and computer fraud. The financial trail led O'Neill to a network of bank accounts in London, Dubai, the Isle of Man, Guernsey, and Jersey. The network investigated coincided exactly with the activities being carried out by the Russian-Israeli mafia and its links to diamond, drug, and weapons dealers that was especially active in New York and Florida. The future 9-11 hijackers and their Israeli shadows had more than living in the same neighborhoods and frequenting the same bars, video rental stores, and rental mailbox stores in common. Who shipped out the steel rubble of the World Trade Center towers? That would be none other than Metals Management, headed by Jew Alan D. Ratner. The most critical evidence to determine what really caused the towers to collapse was quickly destroyed after being sold to Asian smelters. Ratner, of Metals Management, now merged with The Sims Group and the New York-based Hugo New Snitzer East, profited from this criminal destruction of evidence. Ratner sold the World Trade Center steel to Chinese companies, reportedly selling more than 50,000 tons of steel to a Shanghai steel company for $120 per ton. Ratner had paid about $70 per ton for this crime scene evidence. Another central element of understanding how the attacks could be pulled off by the Jewish power elite would be a careful review of the number of dual Israeli citizens serving in the various branches of our government. The primary question here is, how could a person be a citizen of two countries at the same time? It's abundantly clear that such a person would have their loyalty split between the country of residence and the other country they hold citizenship in. Therefore, whose interests would they be working for, the United States or Israel? As reported in a document titled The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy, Harvard professor Stephen Walt and University of Chicago professor John Mersheimer focused attention on the strong Israeli lobby, which has a powerful influence over American foreign policies. They detail the influence the lobby has exerted, forming a series of international policies which can be viewed as in direct opposition to the interests and security of the American people. These acts and policies are more often than not carried out by U.S. government appointees who hold powerful positions and who are dual American-Israeli citizens. Since the policies they support are often exclusively beneficial to Israel, often to the detriment of America, it has been argued that their loyalties are misdirected. A few classic examples can be cited here. Jonathan J. Pollard was an American-Israeli citizen who worked for the U.S. government. He is well known because he stole more secrets from the U.S. than has any other spy in American history. During his interrogation, Pollard said he felt compelled to put the interests of my state ahead of his own. Although as a U.S. Navy counterintelligence specialist, he had a top-secret security clearance. By my state, he meant the state of Israel. Israel. Literally tens of thousands of Americans holding U.S. passports admit they feel a primary allegiance to the state of Israel. In many instances, these Americans vote in Israeli elections, wear Israeli uniforms, and fight in Israeli wars. Many are actively engaged both in the confiscation of Palestinian lands and in the Israeli political system. Three examples follow. Rabbi Meir Kahan founded the militant Jewish Defense League in the U.S in the 1960s, then immigrated to Israel where he was elected to the Neset until he was shot and killed at one of the U.S. fundraising rallies in 1990. The Brooklyn-born rabbi shuttled between Tel Aviv and New York where he recruited militant American Jews for his activities in Israel against Palestinians. He claimed to be a dual citizen of America and Israel. Another Jew, James Mahone from Alexandria, Virginia reportedly was on a secret mission to kill PLO chairman Yasser Arafat when he was shot in 1980 by an unknown assailant. When he was shot, Mahone held an American M-16 in his hand and a U.S. passport in his pocket. Alan Harry Goodman, an American Jew who left his home in Baltimore, Maryland, flew to Israel and served in